Hello guys, welcome back to Custom Gamer. My name is Daz and this is the show where we talk about level design while playing cool maps. This is part two of Assassinateville, the Planet Philip competition where level designers had 10 days to create a map in which you had to kill a target in any way you imagine. Uh, this map is called Harbour Master Blues by Tony DiBlasio aka Starman and it's a pretty typical Starman map in that he uses his own completely original visual language for a lot of things which people take for granted in Half-Life 2. So for instance things like these crates here, not many of them are breakable aside from the obviously the item crates here you can grab but a lot of these crates in here you can't break with the crowbar for some reason. <laughs> There's generally a lot of things like this in the map where Tony will use models in new ways that feel completely alien to kind of veteran Half-Life 2 players, but the visual language is consistent with his own other maps. It's almost like he's mapping in a vacuum where, you know, no one's played Half-Life 2 and doesn't understand what all these things mean, so he's just completely redone the visual language of Half-Life 2 in a lot of ways. And it can lead to a lot of um, frustration and kind of confusion as to how the map works as things which Valve took a lot of time to teach players in the original Half-Life 2 games just don't work the same here for the reasons I've just stated so this intro in the map here I kind of got really really excited on the live stream when I started playing this map because it felt like this intro here had a lot of cool ideas in it but then it just turned out to be completely and totally linear which is a real shame so I kind of figured that finding the metro cop on the front of the train would be like an exploration element that was optional. So if the player explored to the front of the train, they could grab a pistol early, which is kind of cool. But it turns out, nope, you need the pistol to shoot this wooden board here to drop these rocks down to break this grate to get down here. This is the only way out of the area. And wow, it took me ages to find this. It's really not signposted at all. And this is one of those things where it's a one-off mechanic that's never shown to the player beforehand and it's really well hidden in the environment. That's uh, some things which you really shouldn't do all at the same time. It just leads to immense frustration on the player's part. So you've got some rocks up on a cliff which just look like part of the environment. The only thing kind of telling the player that might be something interesting with these rocks is the fact there's a wooden board across them which is hidden really, really well. It's so hard to spot. And the player can't even interact with the wooden board until they find the pistol at the front of the train. And considering all the other things in the environment, things like you've got loads of crates in the train car, I actually, in the live stream, I, I started stacking crates up against all the different fences and train cars, trying to find a way out. Uh, it turns out you can get up there by stacking crates, but there's lots of obvious clip brushes to stop you getting out that way. So yeah, there's lots of other things in the environment which look like they should be the answer, but they're not, because the actual answer is way too well hidden and really not obvious enough for the player. Now, things take a little bit of a step up once we get past that intro area, thank god. <laughs> They're treated with this large open area here. Uh, incidentally, the button to open this door is really, really fiddly. I feel like the... The button that activates this door is actually really, really tiny. You have to be very, very kind of accurate with your aim to actually press the button, which uh, I don't really like in Half-Life games. I feel like sh if you're going to have a button trigger to open something that uses a model like that, just let the button trigger cover the entire model, because a lot of players will just press use anywhere on the model, and if it doesn't work, they'll give up. Whereas here, you have to aim directly at the button on the model to use it. Which again, some players could get stuck there without even thinking that you have to be more accurate because it just doesn't feel natural. So we found the Harbour Master here. We can't get him. Luckily Tony does use the correct glass texture here. That, that glass texture is always unbreakable in Half-Life, so... I feel like it sets up quite nicely that you can't get to him just yet. You have to figure something out. Unfortunately, the map never really lets you figure anything out for yourself. It's always scripted that something will happen and then, then you have to react to it and it will open up the next part of the map for you. You can never really do anything for yourself. You're always just kind of waiting for the map to trigger the next thing. Which I think is a bit of an oversight because the map is quite open in this area. There's lots of different ways you can explore, lots of 
different areas you could have gone to to grab different things or you know activate some contraptions or anything really but uh, as it turns out it's just a giant facade really there's nothing really to do here at all so we're just kind of waiting for the next script to happen right now because there's really nothing we can do and here it comes now I think this fight has a couple of scripting issues but the first main issue here is that there's only one dropship and it lands inside the playable area so you can just completely camp it and kill every single soldier as they come out in single file which is kind of an issue I mean generally when you're doing dropship assaults like this you either land the troops outside the playable area and then let them come in or you use multiple dropships so the player can't camp all of them at the same time uh, as you're seeing here, this is the real problem with it. It's inside the playable area, there's only one of them. So you can just kill every single combine as they come out. But yeah, a bit of an issue there. Uh, with the scripting issues, like the music starts when the final combine gets off the ship. I think it would have been better if the music had started as they started kind of filing out of the ship. Now we have to wait for the next script to happen. And this whole area here that opens up is a little bit strange. Uh, there's a lot of interesting props and things out there which look really important but actually aren't at all. It's a completely dead area, there's actually nothing you can do in there. Uh, this really tripped me up on the live stream. I was sitting outside the uh, pickup truck here for ages trying to work out how to get the contraption to work to pull the car out of the water. You'll see in a minute I go up there and take a closer look at it because it looks like a really important scripted scene. I was thinking maybe there would be a rocket launcher or some kind of uh, key card or anything in the car and you have to pull it out of the water to get to it. But it's actually just a complete total uh, lie here. It looks really important but it's actually not. Yeah, this is one of those things where this whole outside area could have had a lot of unique little events happening in it which a player could activate for themselves. The so things like perhaps that car in the water had a bunch of ammo in it and you can pull it out and get the ammo. Just stuff like that really helps. Now we get to the final fight. I've got to say, although I've been fairly negative about this map so far, the introduction of the Strider is actually really, really cool. I love it. It doesn't make much sense. I mean, you know, why would a Strider be coming out of a, a ship like this? But it's very well presented. But now, of course, we get back into a couple of visual issues. So the idea behind this fight is that the Strider will walk around the environment and shoot various uh, shipping containers which then break and now the player can enter them, like so. The problem is that although that you see the strider shoot something, it's really not obvious at all that anything has actually happened to it. It doesn't actually look like the uh, shipping container has changed in any significant way. Although the model does compress, you can obviously see the damage here, but wherever the player is, the damage state is always really, really hidden from them. I think it would have been really, really cool to have a shipping container right in the center of the arena that gets very obviously damaged by the Strider when it shoots it. So that it's very clear to the player, okay, when the Strider shoots a shipping container, it's going to break and there's going to be stuff in it that I can use. As it stands, it's a cool idea, but it's just not shown to the player well enough, I think. Because once you realise that the Strider is breaking open the containers, the arena works. You understand the flow of it. The only puzzling thing is that, as you can see, the six rockets inside this area don't actually need to go into any more containers. I think the pacing of the fight could have worked a lot better if, kind of at stages of damage, the Strider will open up different containers and you have access to more rockets. You just have to survive until that point. You're kind of being given a slow dribble of uh, rockets and you have to survive until each container is opened. I think that could have been quite cool. And again here, 
I'm not even going to talk about the padlocks. You all know how I feel about this. <laughs> but I love this at the end. So you've got a unique prop, which is something Tony needs to do more of. You've got a unique prop, which doesn't have any visual connotations with Half-Life 2. And it's just kind of obvious what you have to do with it. It's a giant pyrotechnics tin. You want to kill this guy. You can't get to him. And it just works. I knew exactly what to do with it when I saw it. And this is a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> just blowing up the entire thing with pyrotechnics. It, that was really, really cool. A very, very strong ending. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, as with most of Tony's maps, it's just constant visual language problems. Which is a shame. Alright guys, that was part two of Assassinateville. I'll be back with part three pretty soon. Sorry about the lack of videos recently. I've been, again, doing a lot of mapping. Uh, all will be all revealed fairly soon, I think. But it kind of gets in the way of making videos at the same time. So I'll try and release them more soon. And I'll see you next time.